Yeah, I call bull respectfully. That is your absolute world. You're in a World Cup. So everything that happens in or around the training ground, the field, the staff, your teammates, your family, that is your world. So something that big can't happen where it's addressed during the World Cup and there's outside noise and it not be an issue. So I don't buy that. Today is actually the sixth anniversary of the darkest footballing day. Oh, the night Trinidad and Tobago absolutely humiliated the self-soiling United States 2-1. Oh, that night in Curva to eliminate us from the 2018 World Cup. I am still not over that. But one of the single greatest reactions in response to that debacle was a realization by a wave of young American talents that they had to leave the United States to become the best players they could be. And I don't know about you, but my heart rate is finally about down to a normal human level after an incredible weekend of club performances from our American players scattered across the European continent with the mighty Joe Skelly, the pride of Lake Grove, New York, scoring his first of the season in Germany. Flo Balogun's third goal of a tender young French season, propelling Monaco to the top of the league and table. And the dynamic Eunice Musa to Christian Pulisic combo. Oh, just two young American internationals delivering for AC Milan in the 87th minute in their hour of need to send them to the top of the table. And do not get me started on PSV Eindhoven, the only European team with three Americans in the lineup. Also, the only team in Europe's Big Six that hasn't dropped a single point so far. We're rolling into this international break with Costco-sized quantities of momentum, Kirtland signature brand confidence, and now, oh, we international team. Yes, our young American heroes have Avenger assembled for two epic friendlies against two true foes, Germany on Saturday in Connecticut and Ghana next Tuesday in Nashville. And to preview all the big talking points, to Jen, I absolutely love a former striker for the US men's national team, a veteran of both the 2010 World Cup and survivor of the Snow Classico, an insightful and engaging analyst. Oh, and the host of the Vamos podcast right here on the Men in Blazers media network. Bienvenidos, mi amigo. Oh, it's Mr. Hurt Gomez. Raj, how you doing? I, mean, I, I didn't know it was the anniversary of the Trinidad and Tobago game in the U.S. Men's National. I, I, I thought we were past that. You're making me relive like a, a very traumatizing <laughs> few days. Do you, know, do you know what happened? It was my first foray into media work and the oh, so U.S. Your Men's fault. National team. Listen to this. They had a, I remember this closely. The dreaded SPI, the Soccer Power Index for, for ESPN, gave it a 3% chance that the national team, the U.S. men's national team, would not qualify for Honduras, or for, excuse me, for, for um, Russia. It had to be something crazy like Mexico loses to Honduras, Costa Rica uh, beats Panama in Panama, or Panama beats Costa Rica, some, some crazy things like that. And then the U.S. men's national team losing, losing to Trinidad and Tobago and everything happened. Everything moved in the direction that I guess the soccer gods wanted it to move in. And I still remember the next day from 7 a.m. on until I'm not kidding, a midnight sports center every hour on the hour, they put me behind a TV camera to explain why the U.S. Men's Nash team lost. So I'm just as bitter as those players who failed in that conquest. So yeah, uh, thanks for making me relive that. Does it feel like yesterday or does it feel like, whoa, six years? That's kind of like mid-ancient history football-wise. It does feel ancient, and, and credit to these players for that, uh, this this new pool of players. I don't know if you if you saw there was a post game that Weston McKinney did uh, on Max, HBO Max, and Demarcus Beasley was there, and uh, they spoke about Cuba, and Demarcus made a joke, and he's like, hey, that was your guys' fault, not ours, you know? These players are past that. Maybe we're not past that, but these players are past that. They're a reason that we have hope today, this pool. And you mentioned it. It's because they realized they had to, you know, sharpen their iron with the best of them. That is the surging optimism we need because we're just 236 days from the start of next summer's Copa America 2024. But who's counting? And this young United States side does have 
so much bloody potential, individual for individual. We saw in the last window, through some Labour performances, that the collective idea is still very much a work in progress. And coach Greg Berhalter, Triple G, has unfurled this roster for the two big games upcoming, Germany and Ghana, baby. Just sprinkle in some Portugal and we got ourselves a World Cup group, my friend. But I've always wondered this, the gap between the announcement of the roster and these players turning up her, it's so short. I mean, what if you have plans as a player? Uh, how, how much notice do the players actually get behind the scenes? More notice than we as fans, right? I mean, what if Tim Ream had tickets for the Gareth Southgate play in the West End? How does it work behind the scenes? <laughs> Congratulations to Tim Ream. 300 appearances for Fulham. That, the guy's a club legend. Uh, yeah, those plans go out the window, Raj. As a footballer, listen, I was a professional footballer for 17 years. You miss birthdays, weddings, funerals. Uh, you miss important dates in your outside life. And as far as notice, what usually happens, I still remember the first time I got noticed that I would go to the U.S. men's national team. I was in the provisionary roster. Uh, it was a fax. Back in those days, you had a fax. Now you'll get an email. The club will get a direct email, and so will the player. You've been, you're part of the 40-man provisioner, provisional roster. And that'll probably happen maybe a month out, a month and a half at most. But once you get close to the final roster, you'll know pretty much maybe one or two days before the actual roster comes out. So whatever plans you have, put those on hold because the national team awaits. Oh, I'm still waiting, still waiting for that nod. Um, but my Lord, when that 23-man squad was announced, the biggest name in it, obviously two words, Geo. Rainer, the 20-year-old Dortmund creative talent who was also at the centre of the milestone in that post-2022 World Cup brouhaha, truly ugly confection of, of deep family friendship turned to public trauma. Uh, Gio coincidentally just experienced his first minute to the Bundesliga season over the weekend, came on in the 64th minute of Dortmund's 4-2 comeback win over Union Berlin. Actually, he was involved in the fourth goal to boot his first game time since suffering a leg injury on national team duty over the summer. And his return to the squad, truly crucial this moment to the United States well-being. How will it go? You know, that's really one of the most crucial questions, the most crucial storylines of this still young cycle. Honestly, people I've spoken to around the team, they don't know how this is all going to go down. What we do know is that Greg admitted in his Vanity Fair interview uh, at the end of August that he had not yet spoken to Gio um, and that he was planning on consulting with, quote, experts in mediation work so that the two can resolve the dispute, quote, in the right way. And I honestly hoped we'd see some kind of rapprochement visit to Germany by Greg. You know, the two of them having dinner like Greg and the Glasgow boys post old firm Derby last August. The optics of that would have spoken volumes. And the good news we learned last, by a last week's Greg press conference that the two have finally spoken, but it was over Zoom. Breaking months of silence between coach and player, possibly thawing some of the planet hoth like frostiness uh, between the two gents. Greg told reporters that the conversation was, quote, positive, and that it was about the two of them aligning. By the way, how I wish someone had told um, Joe Jonas and Sophie Turner that a long-simmering conflict can be solved like this via Zoom. But first of all, Herc, this is a complex issue for a coach, having to heal a rift in a team culture that he was actually deeply and quite publicly involved in. Have you ever in your playing days had anything kind of vaguely in this ballpark where the manager's got to do visible damage control for something so sensitive with such a key player amid such scrutiny and, and, and high stakes um, where he's emotionally entwined in it all? Not at this level. N not, not so much in the public eye where you're dirty Laundry's just aired like that. The closest that we've come, and I'm sure you remember, Raj, was the 2014, or excuse me, yes, it was a 2014 World Cup um, qualifying cycle with Jurgen Klinsmann. We started out as right before the Snow Classico. Um, Sporting News broke out a story where they had independent sources, players, speak out against Jurgen Klinsmann. His it was like 22 off-the-record anonymous sources from within the team speaking out against Jurgen Klinsmann. I don't remember the exact um, 
amount of players, but it was during it MLS was twenty two, at least twenty two. <laughs> it was an enormous but, number. And I was in that camp, and I remember as a player trying to defuse the situation, you know. Um, but that was as close as I've ever been to a coach feeling like. How many of those twenty two sources were you hurt? <laughs> it was MLS Media Day. I was playing in Mexico, so it wasn't me. <laughs> but I remember, I remember the uncomfortable feeling. Like, who is saying this? By the way, that was a massive pool, right? You had over forty players that played uh, with Jurgen Klinsmann in and out. You had European players. You had a, a base of Liga MX players and MLS players. So all of a sudden, this news comes out in a critical moment. You open the the World Cup qualifying campaign with a loss in San Pedro Sula against uh, Honduras. And your next two games are Costa Rica in Denver, the Snow Clasico, which you mentioned earlier, and the game against Mexico in the Azteca. So they're back-to-back games. So it was putting us behind the wall. And if you remember correctly, Raj, we barely qualified to the hex. Uh, I remember being in Antigua and Barbuda in a cricket stadium in a monsoon and having Alan Gordon and Eddie Johnson you know, come off the bench and save us. If not, That's we're Pete not even... That we're memory. not even... Pete Konkikaf. We're not even... In the hex, you know, it, it was a monsoon. It was crazy type weather. The field, the grass is up to your knees. You're dribbling in puddles. The Snow Classico was a walk in the park compared to that. So all that heading into that in the public eye, if you will. And this was 2013. So yeah. nowhere near the fanfare or the attention the U.S. Men's National Team has today. I couldn't imagine being, one, the player directly involved in that. And two, the coach that has a relationship with said player and having everything just aired out for the world to see. Yeah, I was in Denver um, that day right before the Snow Classic game. And the fact that these sources were anonymous, that that made this different to, to that. There was really a sense amongst the journalists, amongst the players, you know, amongst everyone, the assistant coaches who were just like, it was like the air had been sucked out of just every interaction everyone was having with Jurgen just watching him that's who it was where everyone was watching how he would handle this it's essentially it was a, it was like a uh, an attempted coup um against yeah, his I was power. so angry I was so angry with that because you know you could say what you want about a coach and and their tactics and your opinions of said coach but if you have if you have the testicular fortitude to say something put your name behind it put your name behind it this is the way I feel. Don't say it's anonymous so it drives a wedge into the team and everybody feels this is what the team feels. Put your name behind it. Listen, uh, Jurgen has his faults. I'm forever grateful for Jurgen. I played like 13, 14 straight games for him as a starter, you know, um, on the wing as a nine. He, he gave me an opportunity to try to play my second World Cup. Um, so I'm forever grateful to that. And I've been with coaches who I don't agree with their tactical assessments. But to the best of my abilities, I will go out there and try to do what I can for the team. But if you have the balls to say something, put your name behind it. Yeah. Uh, so that was different um, to this. It was it was in the same kind of zip code, but a very different address. Yeah. This is this is a manager and one single player whose name we do know, and yes. more than that, a crucial player, Geo, and more than that, a, a deeply young player. He's twenty. Um, and the other fascinating thing to me here, Herc, is this United States squad is also so incredibly young, which is something that U.S. soccer has always been very proud of. But when there's conflict inside the squad and, and the coach is, is very much one of the sides uh, of that argument, there's normally, there's normally wise veterans who can come in and, and help the healing. You know, actors go betweens, reach out ahead of time to geo, be intermediaries, buffers. Uh, emotional leaders. This squad, it doesn't have a lot of those kind of players. Tim Ream, um, certainly. Tyler Adams has an incredibly old head for one so young, but he's out with injury. You may think of others, Herc, but there's not a lot of emotional no. cartilage around the bone there to help with the healing in this moment. You're, you're absolutely right. And something so sensitive, Raj, like I'll go back to my time as a national team player. Carlos Bocanegra, over 100 caps. Tim, you know, Tim Howard, over 100 caps. Steve Chirondolo, over 100 caps. Players who played in Europe, big time games. You know, you, you had a Michael Bradley, you know, over 100 caps. Josie Altidore, top three in goal scoring. Clint Dempsey, Landon Donovan. They're just, they're, there's a presence about these players. And the pool today has more talent, 
absolutely. But they're very green, as you said. Tyler Adams was the youngest captain at the 2020 World Cup or 2022 World Cup, excuse me, in Qatar, which is an um, unbelievable feat for him. But it shows you how young this team is. Tim Ream was the veteran of the group, and he'd not been part of the World Cup qualifying process since game one, you know, against against uh, El Salvador. So it, it in 1980. To- <laughs> Just to show you, you know, how green this team was. Great team, good players, but absolutely. And, and such a delicate subject. Like, I don't care how much of a veteran you are. How do you handle one of your biggest players and the coach who have a personal relationship with each other having a rip like this for the world to see? During the World Cup, and it's kept behind closed doors, and then when it's brought to light, the way it's handled post World Cup, you can sit here and say you weren't affected by it, but you absolutely were affected by it. The club or the team at some point was affected by it. How much you let it show is another thing. I mean, so how does this play out? Let, let's let, let's talk about it from, from from both perspectives. If you were advising Greg and he called you for your input on what his messaging should be in this moment, this crucial moment, what would you say? I'm nobody to advise Greg Berhalter, especially on, on, because to me, this isn't a footballing matter. Uh, This, this is a personal matter that you need to sort out. So the professional can work itself out. We have to remember how close Greg Berhalter and the Reinas were the Berhalters and the Reinas and, and how much hurt and suffering and how there are actual victims in this. Rosalind Berhalter is a victim in this for having her story told the way it was told. It was her story. Greg's wife. She, yes, she deserved to be the one to tell it. Uh, Gio Reyna is a victim in this as well. He's He was 19 at the time. He's a teenager. Raj, I don't know what you were like as a 19, 20-year-old, but I can guarantee you. I was bored. I'm not. <laughs> I can guarantee you I'm not the same person now as I was when I was 19, 20, nor do I think the same way. I was an emotional young man. And, and I'll give you an example of today having to see my, my wife, you know, we have kids who are in the school district here in Hermosa and my wife volunteers as a room parent and she has to deal with other parents. And like all of a sudden her worries become my worries. And that's like, it's such a micro level where I'm worried about what she's feeling and what she's doing there. Imagine something like this. So Gio Reyna's parents' traumas, Claudio Reyna, uh, his trauma becomes Gio's trauma. Burr Halter's traumas become Gio's traumas. So I would advise just Greg to, to try to do everything in his power to mend that relationship or at least find common ground on the personal. And then the professional will sort itself out because that's what they're there to do. They're, they're in a privileged position where they're playing a game. But if you can't find that common ground of, of being able to be around each other, respect each other, and move forward, there is no going about this. You know, I, I've got a couple of uh, friends who do comms for, for Premier League teams. Um, I got a note from one of them um, who he, he texted me and he said, if, if I were Greg, uh, I'm going to read this out because I think it's actually fascinating. He said, I would have tried to show a visible sign of rapprochement before this camp. I would, he said, I would have gone to Germany shown that the healing and the unity was the most important thing right now for this team. And also publicly said something along the lines of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you owned a part of it was that was the message he had admitted how painful it was for him and his family, but that he knows upon reflection that he could have, should have played it differently. And that he's learned lessons from this episode, which, which may be behind us, but the lessons he's taken from it will ensure that the, the, the future of this team will look and feel different with Gio clearly being a key player in that future. It's going to be fascinating to hear them both. They will speak um, before these games and how they play it. And for Gio in that regard, what would you say to him? You've, seen, you, you've, you, you've, you've hit the most important point to me already. This is a kid. I mean, really a kid yeah. um, who admitted that he didn't train ahead of the World Cup with full commitment, you know, at, at certain kind of certain petulance, realized his mistake uh, and then was truly burnt by the sacrosanct locker room confidence being betrayed. Um, and he's been clear about that pain. Um, what would you tell him? A gent, we need to remember this. Please, God, we're, we're possibly 
at least three World Cups ahead of him for our nation. Hopefully, knock on wood. You know, that that's the thing with Gio Reyna is his ceiling is so high, but his ability to get on the field, stay on the field is what hampers that ceiling. I would tell him that, like in football, life is about moments and being able to ride those difficult moments. His professional and his personal are crashing in a way in front of the world to see, unlike any footballer in U.S. men's national team history that I could recall. Never before have we had a player with such a high ceiling, but there's always a question mark over that ceiling. Why is the most talented player in the pool, why has he only played 24 minutes this season for Dortmund in the Bundesliga? How will the most talented player in the pool respond to being back with Greg Berhalter face-to-face for the first time? Where does the most talented player in the pool fit tactically under Greg Berhalter? So there's all these questions coming to a head for Gio Reyna. If I could give any piece of advice, it's just, you know, know that this is temporary. You you write out these emotions, these moments um, on the field as you would anything in life and vice versa. Um, God, and watch that Beckham doc, Gio, which a lot of it is borderline fantasy. But the way David Beckham rebounded from the horror of the uh, of just the World Cup uh, darkness, the the 1998 flicking out uh, yeah, Diego Simeone. Card. Yeah, the red card and just rose to become harder, faster, stronger. God, I wish that upon you utterly. Burr Halter has said he's going to build up Rainer's fitness in, quote, a safe way with limited minutes. Um, during a recent interview, goalkeeper Matt Turner said something that you've just hit upon. Um, and I do want to revisit for a second. He said that the GO and, and GGG conflict didn't affect the dressing room at all because the team was, quote, rock solid. Is that how it works on a squad? You know, during your time on the team, what were, were the big conflicts and challenges that, that everyone was aware of, but just utterly overlooked and connected to the mission? H- how do the players experience it? And it, I, I, you've already kind of hinted that there's a gap between what they say and what they really feel. Yeah, I call bullshit on Matt Turner on that one, respectfully. Um, That's your world. That is your absolute world. You're in a World Cup. So everything that happens in or around the training ground, the field, the staff, your teammates, your family, that is your world. So something that big can't happen where it's addressed during the World Cup, okay? And there's outside noise and it not be an issue. So I don't buy that. Them moving on, I can buy that. I can see players moving on. Listen, I've been trained my whole life, and I struggle with my wife sometimes. I'm conditioned to move on. As a forward, I'm conditioned to not worry about what I just missed, to worry about what's to come. So I'm conditioned every day to move on. I can see that. I can see them moving on. But it's an issue, and it will continue to be an issue. And this is on Greg Berhalter. So now here we are. However however many months after the World Cup, and this is still an issue. I watched Greg Berhalter's press conference for this announcement of the roster. The first six people that asked a question, the first six people on the Zoom conference, the reporters, all asked about Geo. All asked about Geo. That's how important this is. So now he addresses Geo. Now it's Geo addressing the media. And then it's Geo addressing the situation. And it'll be Greg Berhalter addressing how Geo looked. Greg Berhalter addressing how Geo acted. This won't go away. And they did it to themselves. So it's it's unfortunate. Godspeed to Geo. Godspeed to Greg. Uh, may this reality find just a footballing and a human solution. But from Geo to Christian, CP10, turn CP11 now, playing some of the most delirious club football of his life for AC Milan. It was it was magical at the weekend to see him turn and spin and thrash Eunice Moose's pass home in the 87th minute. Um, little, little touch of the hand of God uh, or the armpit of God about the goal, but we're American, so we don't care about that. But to watch these two gents combining and just the commentator screaming, Pooley, Pooley, Pooley. Oh, it is amazing. Honestly, it's amazing just to watch him smile during club football matches again after all he's been through at Chelsea. Um, but there is a renewed clinicality and composure that's come with that surging confidence too. Listen, we had 
Christian Pulisic on Vamos, uh, you know, uh, three months ago. And you can tell he was just excited to leave Chelsea. He wanted a refresher. He wanted to be given the opportunity to show what he can do. And he's playing some of the best football of his life right now, Raj. And it's because he's happy. He's genuinely enjoying where he is. He's enjoying playing in front of the San Siro fans. He really likes playing with Oliver Giroud. He really likes playing with Rafa Leao, having Musa on the field with them. And it's showing in his play. He's got four goals, one assist, and he only has one assist. Um, but he's been indirectly involved in multiple other goals for Milan. He's leading Milan in goals right now. He's one goal away from cracking the top five in goal scores, or excuse me, the top three in goal scores in the Serie A. If I go back to his time when he has had better runs, he had a run for Chelsea in 2019-2020 where in all comps, he had 11 goals and 10 assists. Double-digit goals, double-digit assists. He can shatter that record. You know, the other run was his Champions League run where he was instrumental from the, the in the knockout rounds for Chelsea to lift a Champions League. I've not seen this version of Christian Pulisic in quite some time, and it's good to see. Yeah, God, the most fascinating part of that conversation that you had with Pooley Herc, the revelation that our gent was trying so hard to block out the negativity that was yes. swirling around him at Chelsea that he, he carried two phones just to keep his social media off the first phone. Um, I'd really encourage everyone to go back and listen to that interview. You'll see a very human um, and a quite courageous telling of a very uh, a, a, a time of true challenge. And to see him overcome it, has been magical. Um, but it will be fascinating to watch him go against Germany. So many of his former Bundesliga adversaries and teammates uh, in that squad. Um, and in the last window against Uzbekistan and Oman, Pooley honestly cut a, a times frustrated figure on the field, trying to make stuff happen um, with solo runs. What's the key now for Berhalter to get Milan levels out of Pulisic in the US jersey? You know, I don't really think there is a key, Raj, because the U.S. men's national has always kind of been that refresher for Christian Pulisic. When things weren't going well at the club level at Chelsea, where he was starting for minutes, he was starting for that attention, for, for that make me feel valued. The U.S. men's national team gave it to him, and that's why I really think he was so vocal about bringing Greg back. If you think about the coaches that he's had, Greg's been instrumental in him feeling like an important piece to the U.S. men's national team. I really think with Christian Pulisic, He's just scratching the surface it's about keeping him healthy. How do you manage him? How do you keep him healthy? How do you keep him engaged on the field? And the rest will fall into place. Let's dive into our striker QB1 controversy. Last window, honestly, the attack struggled to put a dent in Uzbekistan's back line uh, for a huge part of that game. Um, but we got ourselves a striker battle. First of all, oh, back then, Flo Balagan, it's got to be said, was still on pre-season form, was almost easing himself back into 90 minutes of football. He has since had a fine, fine start to the season at Monaco, thrashing goals for fun, penalties, not so much. <laughs> but that gent loves being fed the ball in the box and always fancies his chances uh, on the turn. And you're a striker, Herc. What, what have you seen watching Ballo light up league earn this season? Well, let me tell you off the bat, which is just very, very obvious. Uh, his movement is excellent. He's got the best movement in the pool. His runs are crisp. They're fast. They're decisive. They're direct. There's purpose in his movement. Um, if I'm Greg Berhalter, I have to find a way to take advantage of that movement. And this is where Giovanni Reina comes in. You saw it with BJ Callahan in the Nations League, how they connected. Very good interlinking play, understanding of the spaces, understanding of his movements. Gio in that 10 role was instrumental. So to get the best out of Fowler and Balogun, you have to take advantage of his movement and the goals will come. You know, this is such a fascinating framing because one of the hallmarks of Berhalter's first cycle was was you know a real obsession with system, system, yeah. system, system. Yes. And Ballo seems like a different kind of striker to the ones Greg kept trying to shuffle through last time round. You know, I see Ballo score and and at times think, forget the system. This is international football. Let's work out how to get the best out of this gift of a player. But but how do you believe Greg will see it? I think he's starting to see 
um, what he has. You could see it at halftime of the last game versus Oman, where Father and Balogun actually did score in that half. Father and Balogun was upset. He didn't think he was being found enough. You're absolutely right, Raj, on the system, system, system. That nine isn't catered to score goals in the Greg Berhalter system. That nine is to facilitate the wing play, facilitate the Christian Pulisics, the Timothy Weyas, be dangerous in their wing progressions. It's not for the nine to finish. Um, and that's why Jesus Ferreira was so valuable in Greg Berhalter's mind, his interpretation of space. He played the nine position as a false nine. A false nine gets others involved. He's not the one who ends the play. Well, Father and Balogun, if anything, has shown me that he's mentally strong. You don't miss a penalty kick and then have the mentality take another penalty kick if you are weak of mind. He takes the second penalty kick and misses it. And what was his immediate reaction to a game that they lost, by the way? Was to go on a goal-scoring streak. Was to show him how good I am. And now, and now Monaco are atop of the French League in large part to Fowler and Balogun and what he's doing. Ben Yedder is the captain and goal scorer of that team, and he made the coach say, you know what, I need to play with these two nines because I need to keep this kid on the field because I love his runs, I love his mentality, I love his goal scoring ability. Greg Berhalter is going to have to find a way to constantly keep this player involved because he's shown in limited time, both club and country, he can make a difference. You know, the first time I ever interviewed Pep Guardiola, we, we talked about how he expects his defenders and his midfielders. He, he believes he can control that every move, a bit like Bill Belichick in his prime. Um, but that he let his strikers, back then it was Kuna Guerrero, he said, I let my strikers improvise. He's like, when I watch them, even I feel surprised at what they do. Um, the, he compared them to like Miles Davis, in, uh, jazz improv. And, and talking about great <laughs> improvisers, we have to raise our cap to the truly phenomenal Ricardo Pepe, another uh, gent who's been a guest on, on, on Vamos. That gent still just 20. But man, all he's done is be written off, discarded, only to dust himself off and just rise and soar and keep scoring goals. You know, Ballo's the striker in the spotlight, but Pepe... Pepe keeps on keeping on, scoring important goals for this United States team when they need him. If you were U.S. manager, Hurt, and you had to pick a starting striker, who would it be and why? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Uh, I think right now it'll be Ballo. It's going to be Fuller and Balogun. Um, but what I love about Ricardo Pepe is Ricardo Pepe is not going to go quietly into the night. He's going to fight every single time we had him on Vamos, and it was very evident that this man plays for something else. He's the head of a household at 20 years of age. He's responsible for the well-being of not only himself, but for his family. He feels slighted by not going to the 2022 World Cup, and rightfully so. He literally saved Greg Berhalter's job in the opening window, and he was the second leading goal scorer of the team, only behind Christian Pulisic. Nobody affected the game like Ricardo Pepe. He's a unique striker that can offer the goal scoring ability, but with interlinking play. He really has a complete skill set. If you look at last window versus Oman, there's a beautiful play that he has with Weston McKinney, where Weston just shoots it wide, leaves Weston alone clear-cut chance against the Oman goalkeeper and Weston pulls it wide if you look at how he's playing with PSV where the captain is in front of him Luke De Jong the captain right now who has five goals and is one of the leading goal scorers in the area of Divisi he's right there nipping at his heels where Peter Bosch the head coach of PSV is like the only thing that he has going against him is that the team captain is in front of him and the team captain scoring <laughs> goals but every time he comes on the field Raj he affects the game <laughs> Against Sevilla in the Champions League, Ricardo Pepe comes in. Beautiful interlinking play with Malik Tillman, the U.S. international. Malik gets taken down by Sergio Ramos. Penalty kick. And then it's Ricardo Pepe who draws a free kick that Chucky Lozano whips in for them to tie the game at two. Chucky, sorry, um, Ricardo Pepe, every single time he plays, whether it's club or country, he is known. You know he plays. That is valuable to me. So right now it's Ballo. But in any given moment, 
with Ricardo Pepe nipping at his heels and with the hunger that this kid has, I have no problem slotting him in. You know, the way you describe it, I actually don't mind Pepe coming off the bench with real sizable minutes to run at tiring defenders. Um, and you've said before that Pepe plays for the family name on the back of his shirt and the crest on the front of it, which I just love. It sounds like some kind of beautiful footballing proverb, uh, a sacred one passed down from generation to generation. And I want to talk about the games upcoming in a moment, but one new face in this squad that we should welcome and acknowledge and marvel at, Leonard Maloney, versus our 24-year-old, who's making a name for himself in the Bundesliga with Heidenheim, uh, where he's played 33 or 34 games last season in the Swabian team's improbable promotion uh, to the top flight. Heidenheim's changing fortune. It's really an incredible story in itself, worth uh, Googling a little bit. Just over a decade ago, they were playing in the semi-pro regional Liga, the fourth tier of German football. Now they're in the Bundesliga for the first time in their history. I think Heidenheim is is apparently German for Luton Town. But as a team, <laughs> Maloney, I love this. He grew up in Germany with an American Air Force dad and a German mother. He said he had a jersey signed by Bobby Wood and fellow Jamaican John Brooks hanging over his bed. And now Triple G could be eyeing him as a as a potential uh, replacement, temp- temporary replacement, please God, for Tyler Adams, who remains out with an agonizingly long hamstring injury. Herc, what do you know about our new boy Leonard and how he could fit him? All right, so Leonard Maloney's been in the radar on the, on the radar for the U.S. Men's National Team for at least over three years, and he's made it known in, in various interviews he's done in the past um, that he would like to play for the U.S. Men's National Team. He's a he's a Union Berlin Academy product. He's a center back, Raj. Good size on him, 6'2", 200 pounds, very good size, very good feet, but was always a center back. Uh, goes out of Union Berlin, which is why he has the the jersey to Bobby Wood and to John Brooks, because he was in and around that area, um, and, and finds himself at Borussia Dortmund. Doesn't really play with Borussia. Um, so he decides the second that, team. Yeah, Borussia too. He decides, I think he played, he debuted, played maybe four games, Raj, and he decides he needs to take a step back to progress his footballing career. Uh, ends up at Heidenheim. Last year has a ridiculous year when they move him into a defensive midfielder role and they get promoted. He started every single game this year. Um, Greg Berhalter highlighted what he likes about Leonard Maloney, that he covers so much ground. He's a defensive midfielder that covers so much ground in the Bundesliga. That is not just Leonard Maloney. He's a very good player, very soft feet, but he has something that is missing when Tyler Adams is not on the field. You don't have a true six. You are wedging in. Eunice Musa and Weston McKinney. You're wedging in Luca De La Torre uh, with one of those two players to try to fulfill two players to fulfill what a Tyler Adams has done. Do not be mistaken if you're a U.S. Men's National Team fan, the importance of Tyler Adams. He's the most important player uh, for Greg Berhalter and has proven it. He was a standout player at the last World Cup, the youngest captain in U.S. Men's National Team history and youngest captain at that World Cup. Leonard Maloney has one thing that is missing right now that maybe Johnny Cardozo has, the international player, um, but Greg Berhalter has not given Johnny that opportunity. He is a ball winner. He loves to hunt. He loves to be aggressive, but he's very clean in the way he goes about it, and he's learning this position. I I love the call-up. I love these type of stories. Uh, It's a position of need, and with Tyler Adams being out for the indefinite future, hopefully he gets better. Uh, it's a player to watch out, watch out oh, for. Welcome, playoff Lenny. Uh, but some quality opponents coming out this next week. Really, really, really. Germany under new management. Yes, yeah, skateboarding style warrior Julian Nagelsmann in his very first game. Um, unsurprisingly, perhaps leaned heavily on his former Bayern roster when putting the team together. Might have considered giving you Bayern striker Harry Kane a citizenship exam, asking him some questions about the Schengen Agreement and issuing him an Adidas shirt. But this is not the Germany of our imagination. Die Mannschaft, 
um, has struggled on the international stage of late. They crashed out the past two World Cups in the group stages. And until he can out a 2-1 win against France last month, they'd had a five-match winless streak in friendlies, which is almost unfathomable for a German team. Nagelsmann, desperate to pick up the pieces, help this team reassemble itself like some kind of liquefied T-1000 uh, in front of a terrified Edward Furlong. But after being appointed Germany's manager, he said he, quote, wanted to play football with a specific idea. And we'll find out exactly what that idea is at the weekend in Hartford. It's got to be said, listening to the German players grumbling to their own media about having to schlep to the United States in the middle of their season doesn't augur particularly well for a motivated performance. That's followed with a clash in Nashville against God. Ghana, the mighty Black Stars, who slipped to 60th in the FIFA World Rankings, but are still led uh, by former Norwich City, Brighton and Forest manager, the legendary Chris Hewton. Uh, they're down to a single IU brother now, Crystal Palace's Jordan, but also feature Brighton's, oh, just what a mischievously creative player he is, Tariq Lamptey, West Ham's Mohamed Kudus and Arsenal's Thomas Partey. Two very different challenges for Triple G. What do you think the stakes are for him, really? I mean, these are undoubtedly the two best sides he's managed against since being dumped out of the World Cup in around the 16, 3-1 by, by a laughing Netherlands almost. Louis van Gaal saying after the game that the Americans didn't adapt or adjust to his plans. Quote, um, I think these games are more than anything, Herc. A chance for Greg to prove himself. and Really a, an important opportunity um, to win over at least some of the American fans who were dubious about his reappointment. What, what, what do you think Greg has to prove over the course of these two games? Uh, and what lessons from the first cycle are you looking for him to show that he's learned? I, I couldn't agree more, Raj. This is a barometer for Greg Berhalter and the U.S. men's national team. Um, if you go through a coach's tenure, you think about marquee wins for a coach. You know, you can go Bob Bradley ended – Spain's 35 game unbeaten run in the Confederations Cup and made it to the final and was 2 0 up at halftime before they ended up losing to Brazil in the Confederation final. You know, Bruce Arena uh, and what he did almost getting to a, you know, a semifinal, if not for a Tor Torsten Springs handball that, that should have been called, you know, beating Mexico in, in, in the second round to get to that quarterfinal. Um, Jurgen Klinsmann. You know, first coach to win in Estadio Azteca, beat Italy, beat Germany, beat the, you know, beat the Netherlands, uh, in Europe, all these marquee wins. When you look at Greg Berhalter, his marquee wins can't be winning finals against the worst generation of Mexican players that I've ever seen. It can't be winning one game at the World Cup, beating Iran, and then bowing out in the next round in the way he did. You have to show fans that there is progression that there is hope out there with arguably, not arguably in my mind, the greatest collection of American players that you've ever had in your history. So the bar is high. And even though Germany is on tough times, it still is Germany. Listen, they bowed out at the last two World Cups. There's a reason they're not happy about coming all the way to North America to play these games. They're trying to get ready for the Euros, which they are hosting. So going in different time zones with players now in this congested calendar can only invite trouble, can only invite injury. So I understand Thomas Tuchel, the the uh, Bayern Munich coach, being upset that five of his players are making this trek. But it's a very good test, a very good collection of players with a very good coach, and uh, uh, excuse me, Julian Nagelsmann, um, who will be making his debut with the German national team. So it's very important for Germany. So it's going to be a very big test for the U.S. men's national team and Greg Berhalter. And then Ghana. If there's a bigger thorn on the side of the U.S. men's national team in its history, it is Ghana. I mean, they knocked you out of two World Cups. You know? You were fortunate. You, 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 were, you, you were in that 2010 one, so you can say us. Yes. They knocked us out of two World Cups. You know, and, and, and it hurts. And Ghana's been that team. One of the lasting memories that I have was Claudio Reyna coming out injured versus Ghana in the 2006 World Cup and thinking, wow, look at Ghana. And then after that, Ghana has just been a consistent thorn in 2010. You know, in 2014, they beat Ghana. You know, and it's just, 
it's always one of those teams that's just very, very difficult. And you mentioned the players that they have. They, they're going to have quality players. You know, God, come on, you United States boys. Put in a performance. You can do it. I'd also love to see uh, the United States team playing some sold out stadia. I'm going to say watching Mexico barnstorm from NFL Stadium to NFL Stadium. Watching Megan Rapinoe's final game play out before an NWSL record setting 34,130 last Friday. Watching Messi's frenzy. Those kind of crowds say I dream of a day. The United States men can can sustain and support that kind of momentum. Um, please God, it will be it will be soon. But it's crystal ball time now, Herc. What are your score predictions for these two games? United States, Germany, Triple G 2.0 and Julian Nagelsmann, and then the red, white, and blue against the Black Stars. For the Germany game, the US are are underdogs, right? Plus 280. It's not going to be an easy game. It's the debut game for Julian Nagelsmann. Um, I Good do think, Julian. yeah, I do think Julian comes out with the win. I'll go two one Germany. Uh, the Black Stars. This game, they're preparing for Afcon, their their African uh, Nations tournament. Um, it will be a good test. They are missing some players. I will give the edge to the states in this one, and I will go two zero states on that one. So I think they'll split results one and one. God, I actually think I actually got a good feeling about Saturday, Herc. I think we beat Germany 2-1. Zwei uns! Um, for those listeners uh, in Deutschland, Polisic and Ricardo Pepe with the goals. The Ghana game, I think it's a 2-2 draw. Geo scores, though. Life Ooh. is good. That's my hope anyway. I love magical thinking. Herc, you are a beautiful bloke. Your podcast, Vamos, is a must-listen for anyone and everyone who wants to truly understand what's going on in our magical region. It is full on CONCACAF thunder in the face. You're a beautiful human being. It's a joy to be with you, mate. Raj, thanks for having me. Vamos every single Thursday here on the Men and Blazers Network. Oh, God bless. And go, go USA. Courage. <laughs>